The scripture reading today will be from the book of Isaiah, chapter 41, verses 8 through 12. But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners, I called you. I said, you are my servants. I ha servant, I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be nothing at all. Good morning, everybody. This is going to be interesting without the confidence monitor here, so I'm going to be turning around a lot as well. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody out. Our numbers are a little bit smaller than what they have been. This is the first Sunday in a while. We haven't had to fight for seats and elbow each other. So it's uh, got a little more breathing space, but I guess people heard I was preaching. So um, uh, in reality, it's probably the holiday. We're getting ready to celebrate uh, Independence Day this week on Tuesday. And it's a day where we can reflect on our freedoms as citizens of this country. Uh, we're given a lot of independence on how we can live our lives. We can say what we want to say. We can do what we want to do, eat what we want to eat, worship who we want to worship. And every four years, we can very calmly and peaceably decide who wants to lead our nation. Um, that doesn't actually happen like that, but we still get to choose uh, nonetheless. Um, we have the ability to choose our own path and do whatever we want to do as individuals. On the other side, depending on people, a lot of times makes things a lot more difficult. Uh, it generally slows things down. It, things don't get done the way we want them done or how we want them done or in the pace that we want them done. Uh, independence allows us to do what we want, how we want to do it, and the pace that we prefer. However, in our Christian walk, this independence is something that we are called to remove in our lives. We are called to lessen our reliance on ourselves and start depending on God for everything that we do in this life. The Bible is filled with passages telling us that God will be there to guide us through our lives and get us through anything that we may encounter. We are told to lean on him and he'll carry us through. John 15 verses 4 through 7 says, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not <laughs> abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. We may feel like we're accomplishing so much in this world. We can progress in our jobs, we can buy so many things, impress so many people, but without God, we're actually accomplishing nothing of value. Psalm 28 verses six through nine says, "'Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard "'the voice of my pleas for mercy. "'The Lord is my strength and my shield. "'In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exalts, and with my song I give thanks to him. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. Oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Continuing to Psalm, Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. And then the verse that we read in Isaiah, I'm going to read again and expand a little bit. I'm going to read verses 8 through 20. Isaiah 41, verses 8 through 20. But you, O Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, 
You whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all who are incensed against you shall be put to shame and confounded. Those who strive against you shall be nothing and shall perish. You shall seek those who contend with you, but you shall not find them. Those who war against you shall be as nothing at all. For I am the Lord your God. Hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. Fear not, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I am the one who helps you, declares the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I make you a threshing sledge, new, sharp, and having teeth. You shall thresh the mountains and crush them, and you shall make the hills like chaff. You shall winnow them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the tempest shall scatter them, and you shall rejoice in the Lord, and the Holy One of Israel you shall glory. When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights, and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water, and the dry land springs of water." I will put in the wilderness the cedar, the acacia, the myrtle, and the olive. I will set in the desert the cypress, the plain, and the pine together, that they may see and know, may consider and understand together, that the hand of the Lord has done this. The Holy One of Israel has created it. How does it get any more clear than this? The Bible is filled with passages that say God's going to be there for us through any trials in our life. So why do we as individuals and as Christians keep depending on the world and keep trusting in ourselves and the things around us to get things done and not depending on God. We let the things that may look nice in the world creep into our lives and we let pride get in the way of God helping us. So let's take a look at some of the consequences of not depending on God and depending on things of this world. The first one is that it blinds us to reality. Let's turn to Exodus verses, chapter 16, and we're going to read verses 11 through 18. Exodus 16, verses 11 through 18. Here we're going to read about a problem that Israel was having and God's answer to that problem. Exodus 16, verses 11 through 18 reads, and the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was a face in the wilderness, a fine, flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each of you, as much as he can eat. Each shall take an omer, according to the number of persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered, some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever ga gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. So God provided for his people. The Israelites were super happy. They remained happy. And that was the end of the story. Of course, that is not what happened at all. So let's continue on and read Numbers 11, verses 4 through 6. Numbers 11, verses 4 through 6. This is the response after they'd been eating this miraculous food for a while. Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving, and the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. There is nothing at all but this super miraculous food that we don't deserve that God has given us that fills us up so we can never be hungry again. Our strength is dried up. The strength that we're supposed to have in you that can never fail is dried up. Unfortunately for God and for the Israelites, this isn't even the only time that they complained about what God has provided for them. Let's turn over to Numbers 14. Numbers 14, and we're going to read verses 1 through 4. 
This is, um, this is after getting the report from the spies about the promised land and how there's some scary people there. Um, this is a response to that. Then all the cr congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we have died in the land of Egypt, or would that we have died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, Let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Do we ever do this? Do we ever look at the world around us and see a situation we don't want to face and try to go back to something that was worse, but in our heads we have built it up to something that was actually better? The grass wasn't always greener before, and it's not always greener on the other side. That, keeps, that leads us to our next consequence of keeping us away from our ultimate reward. Let's read... Numbers 32, verses 6 through 13. Numbers 32, verses 6 through 13. Actually, I'm going to read through verse 15. 6 through 15. In this, the context of this verse is the tribes of Gab, Gad and Reuben didn't want to enter the promised land because they had a lot of livestock, and the place where they were was okay for that livestock. So they didn't want to partake in what God had promised them. And this is the response, Numbers 32, verses 6 through 13. But Moses said to the people of Gad and to the people of Reuben, shall your brothers go to war while you sit here? Why will you discourage the heart of the people of Israel from going over into the land that the Lord has given them? Your fathers did this when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. For when they went up to the valley of Eskel, and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the people of Israel from going into the land that the Lord had given them. And the Lord's anger was kindled on that day, and he swore, saying, Surely none of the men who came up out of Egypt from twenty years old and upward shall see the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me. None except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and the Kenizzite, and Joshua the son of Nun, for they wholly followed the Lord. And the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness forty years, until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was gone. And behold, you have risen in your father's place, a brood of sinful men, to increase still more the fierce anger of the Lord against Israel. For if you turn away from following him, he will again abandon them in the wilderness, and you will destroy all this people." We can't truly take part in the rewards given to us by God if we remain anchored in this world. The next consequence that we have is that it removes the freedoms we have through our faith. Let's read 2 Kings verses 17. Or 2 Kings chapter 17 verses 6 through 8. At this point, Hosea, the king of Israel, is doing evil in the sight of the Lord. He's giving tributes to the king of Assyria, and he decides to stop doing that, not to turn back to God, but to instead turn towards Egypt, which uh, the king of Assyria doesn't take kindly to, and that's where we pick up here. 2 Kings 17, verses 6 through 8 says, In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of, Assyr the king of Assyria captured Samaria, and he carried the Israelites away to Assyria and placed them in Halah, and on the Habor the river of Gozan, and the cities of the Medes. And this occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods, and walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel, and in the customs that the kings of Israel had practiced. At this point, they're no longer a free nation. They are captured and taken away from their homes, away from the promised land that God had given them. We don't have a physical promised land that God has given us, but as we talked about in Bible class and as Jacob mentioned in the prayer, we have freedom from sin. Uh, and that is a lot at stake for us. Uh, John 8 verses 31 through 36 reads, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my world, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? 
Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Romans 6, verses 3 through 7 says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. When we depend on this world, we're separating ourselves from Christ. We lose the freedom from sin that we obtain through Christ, and we once again become slaves to sin. So now on a happier note, let's talk about some of the benefits of actually depending on God and setting aside the things of this world. Uh, the first one that I have is that God fights your battles for you. Let's take a look at the story of Gideon in Judges 7. Turn with me to Judges 7. We're going to start with verses 2 and 3. Judges 7, verses 2 and 3. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand. Lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now for, now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. The tw then 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. So the Midianites are oppressing the Israelites at this point, and Gideon is called to deliver them from that oppression. He has an army of 32,000 men, and God says, nope, that is too many. If you defeat the Midianites, you are going to think that you are the ones that did it. So he tells Gideon, tell everybody that is afraid, go ahead and leave. And two-thirds of his army leaves. That leaves him with 10,000, which may seem like a pretty good sized army still. Um, but the next chapter, we figure out that they're about to fight an army of 135,000 people. So 10,000, that's a, a pretty big difference there. Um, but this is still too many for God. So let's read verses four through eight. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Take them down to the water and I will test them for you there. And anyone whom I say to you, this one shall go with you shall go with you. And any of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps the water with his tongue as dogs lap, you shall set, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouths, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, with the, with the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand and let all the others go, every man to his home. So the people took provisions in their hands and their trumpets and sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, but retained the 300 men and the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. So now they're left with 300 men to take on 135,000. If I'm one of these 300 guys, I am regretting the fact that I did not leave the uh, first round when I was told I could. So um, at this point, there is no mistaking. If they win this battle, it's God that will have delivered them from this. So let's read how that turns out in Judges 7, verses 9 through, 19 through 22. Judges 7, 19 through 22. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, when they had just set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hand. Then the three companies blew the trump then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hands the torches, and in their right hands the trumpets to blow, and they cried out, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Every man who stood in his place around the camp, all and all the army ran. They cried out and fled. When they blew the 300 trumpets. The Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. And the army fled as far as Beth Shittah towards Zerira and as far as the border of Abel Malela by Tabath. So fortunately for these 300 guys that they don't even have to pick up their swords. God has a plan and it turns out that the vast majority of the Midianite army just kills each other because of God's plan. Gideon leaned on God, and God defeated the Midianites for him. 
Now let's talk about Hezekiah. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 37, verses 21 through 29. Isaiah 37. I'm going to read 21 through 29, and then I'm going to skip down to 33. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Because you have prayed to me concerning Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. She despises you, she scorns you, the virgin daughter of Zion, she wags her head behind you, the daughter of Jerusalem. Whom have you mocked and reviled? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes to the heights? Against the Holy One of Israel. By your servants you have mocked the Lord, and you have said, With my many chariots I have gone up the heights of the mountains to the far recesses of Lebanon, to cut down its tallest cedars, its choicest cypresses, to come to its remotest height, its most fruitful forest. I dug wells and drank waters to dry up with the sole of my feet all the streams of Egypt. Have you not heard that I determined it long ago? I planned from days of old what I now bring to pass, that you should make fortified cities crash into heaps of ruins, while their inhabitants, shorn of strength, are dismayed and confounded, and become like plants of the field, and like tender grass, like grass on the housetops, blighted before it is grown. I know you're sitting down, and you're going out and coming in, and you're raging against me. Because you have raged against me, and your complacency has come to my ears, I will put my hook in your nose, and my bit in your mouth, and I will turn back on the way by which you came. And I will turn you back on the way by which you came. Jumping down to 33 and finishing through the rest of the chapter. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city or shoot an arrow there or come before it with a shield or cast up a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same he shall return and he shall not come into this city, declares the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. And the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the people arose early, early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived at Nineveh. And as he was worshiping in the house of Nishrak, his god, Adremelech and Sherezer, his sons, struck him down with the sword. And after they escaped into the land of Ararat, Esaradon, his son, reigned in his place. Hezekiah knew that he could not defeat the Assyrians on his own, and God took care of his enemies for him. So do we truly know and feel that way about the trials that we face in this world? Do we know that we can't take them on our own? Do we spend a lot of time trying to fix it ourselves? Maybe if we have a problem with sin, I don't want to get anyone else involved. I can fix it by myself. I don't need my family here. I don't need God's help. I can just do it on my own. This is pride getting in the way of us depending on God. The next benefit of depending on God that I have is that he gives you strength. Paul's writings are filled with him telling the churches to stop relying on themselves and to start relying on God for strength. Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 13 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand an evil day and having done all to stand firm. Philippians 4 verses 10 through 13 says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly now that at length you have reviewed your, revived your concern for me. You are indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul learned the secret. And the secret is that he doesn't have to do anything. All he has to do is rely on God, and God will carry him through. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10 says, So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Even in difficult times, Paul understands that when you're depending on God, it doesn't matter what your situation in this life is. He will carry you through. He is in control. In fact, the weaker you are, the more room his power has to work in your life. Psalm 68 verse 35 says, Awesome is God from his sanctuary, the God of Israel. He is the one who gives power and the strength to his people. Blessed be God. Our dependence on God can lead us to gaining the strength we need to overcome challenges in this world and bring others to Christ. It is important for us to remember that the strength that we're receiving is not strength that we're gaining on our own. It's strength that we're receiving from Christ. The next benefit is that God's will is done through you. We're going to go through um, the very end of Joseph's story here. Um, If you don't know the story of Joseph, he was the favorite son out of 12, and his brothers hated him for that. So they decided to kill him, but instead of killing him, they end up throwing him into a pit and then selling him uh, into slavery where he ends up in the house of Potiphar. And there he is uh, blessed by God and gains some power in Potiphar's house until he's falsely accused of something and thrown in prison. And then in prison, he is again blessed by God because he depends on him and gains power there where he is finally able to interpret Pharaoh's dream and uh, save Egypt and the surrounding world from a famine that was happening, which is how his brothers ended up coming to Egypt. Uh, They heard that there was food in Egypt and Joseph ended up having some power and he provided for them. So we pick up the story after their father dies and they're afraid of the consequences of their actions earlier in life. Genesis 50, verses 15 through 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgressions of your brother and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and for your little ones. Then he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph understood that God put him through the trials that he was in, so that God could work through his life and in turn save the people around him. And I mean, that's a lesson that we can take today. We go through a lot of things in our life, which makes us relatable and puts us in a position to help others in our life, whether that be from the blessings that we have or from the hardships that we face that we're able to bring other people to Christ through that experience. Our feet want to go where our heart already is. The Israelites wanted to go back to Egypt because their heart was still in Egypt. Paul depended on God because his heart was with God. Romans 6 verses 12 through 14 says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves righteousness to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. When we have sin in our hearts, when that sin rules over us, we become instruments of that sin. We stop relying on God and move more into the world around us. So we know what dependence looks like and the benefits that we get from that. We know that God will fight your battles for you. Sometimes you won't even have to do anything but remain steadfast in your faith and trust in God. We know he'll give you strength. You don't have to be strong. As Christians, we draw on the strength of Christ to carry us through. And we know that God's will can be done through us. God will work in our lives, but we have to get rid of our pride, our passions, and our worldly desires to give him room to work in our lives. On the other side, we know some consequences. It blinds us to reality. We start to see the things of this world and like them. We become blind to the truth when we stop relying on God. 
It keeps us from our ultimate reward. We don't get to enter the promised land if we abandon God and get too attached to the things of this world. And it removes the freedoms we have from our faith. Romans, Romans tells us that we can't be free from sin and still live our lives in a sinful way. If you go on living worldly, sinful lives, you are slaves to sin and no longer have the freedom that you gained through Christ. So we are all following something. This morning, are you going to choose to continue being a slave to sin? Or will you start depending fully on God and in that dependence gain freedom and hope of living eternally with him in heaven one day? If you've already put on Christ and find yourself depending on things of this world, it's not a choice that you make one time. You can make the decision to start depending on God. It's a decision that we all have to make every single day of our lives. So if you need the help of the congregation in any way, please come forward as we stand and as we sing.